I added this, a player-driven, world-building server in Minecraft. After almost two years of being up, I added this is being reset and turned into a new map with endless new possibilities. Very exciting, I know. But that does mean that the story of I added this version 1 will soon be concluded and end forever. Which is why in this video I will go over the server's entire history from start to finish. Now, disclaimer, only significant events will be mentioned. So, I'm sorry, but your character's 12 page lore bug will not be discussed here. Or, likely ever for that matter. To make things easier, I've separated the editors into five different eras, starting from the very beginning to the very end. So, this may take a little while. So sit back and enjoy the entire history of Iadidus. On August 16th, 2021, Bloody Belgian, the server's owner, opened up Iadidus. This would begin the first ever error within Iadidus, an error later known as the SNP error. A day after the server's creation, three towns would be created. Ulfril by the player Brocky12, Zenith by the player Jefferfish, and finally Jungle Town by the players Pumpkin Pie, Fady, and His King22. Despite these towns being created on the same day, it is often accepted that Ulfril was created first, making it the first ever known town to be created in Iadidus. The following day, Jungle Town was mysteriously griefed by an unknown player. It happened on the same day, one of its founders, Pumpkin Pie, left the town to create the town of Holnies. A little over a week later, this first significant nation was created, that being the Empire of Tanu, which was founded by Isai Y and Simply Just Lazy. The creation of Tanu would mark the end of the shortly lived SMP era. However, a new era was beginning in Iadidus, and an era that would change everything. The Albion era lasted for a period of four months, and would see the birth of countless notable nations. On September 4th, 2021, the Confederate Republic of Albia was founded by the players F.S. Seeker, Emmy Noob, G the Crossbower, and Ator Hector. Albia would immediately begin building and developing their nation at a speed never before seen, which would thrust them firmly into the center of attention. Two days after the creation of Albia, the city-state of Avicen was founded by the Enlightened One, Lat. The following day would see Iadidus' first major conflict. The infamous bandit known as Rimen was angered after the death of his two pet parrots. As a result, Rimen began an uprising against Albia, a conflict later recognized as the Battle for Antonio. A few days after the conflict, the first consul of Albia, F.S. Seeker, and the Emperor of Tanu, Simply Just Lazy, entered talks to a potential alliance between the two growing nations. However, the discussions were cut short when the bandit Rimen interrupted the meeting and attempted to kidnap Simply, but was unsuccessful. A month later, the player known as Eldron founded Varshard, which would later become the capital for the soon-to-be-created nation known as the Sentinels. More time passed as more and more nations began appearing and developing, such as the Dominion of Gaveb, Solaris, Lima, and the Constadel. Besides the usual banditry problems, conflict remained minimal. However, this would not last for long. In a sudden turn of events, simply just lazy, the Emperor of Tanu would wage war upon Vodacon's nation of Solaris in an effort to kill the player, the Cool Aid Cat, who was under the nation's protection. The rapidly growing nation of Gaveb had been painted as a threat by most outside nations, and seeing a potential ally in Tanu, Gaveb offers their assistance to
to simply just lazy in his battle against Solaris. Seeing the potential collapse of a close friend, the Confederate Republic of Albia joins the war, vowing to fight side by side with the Solaris forces. This would later lead to the first war for Iadalus. The first battle would take place in the capital of Solaris, Ethia. The battle began as a stalemate, however, the upper hand would slowly begin to shift towards the Albion and Solaris forces due to the better gear they both possessed. It was not long before the Gvabian forces retreated after suffering heavy casualties and a mass shortage of supplies. The Kaiser of Gvab, AU Ryder, called his army to swiftly regroup at their capital of Spinitz. Gvab would attempt to perform a counter-attack but due to their lack of supplies and having lost their best soldiers, Gaveb was forced to enter discussions for peace, marking the end to the war. As the largest war at the time, the first war for Iadidas stood as an example to all that Iadidas could unite and fight a common enemy even with conflicting backgrounds, such as the appearance of Rimen, who held back up the Solaris and Albion forces as they lay siege to Gaveb after the signing of the treaty. Peace, however, would not remain long in Iadidus. Tanu was seeking revenge against the involvement of Albia during the First War of Iadidus. Hearing the news of a new potential conflict, the leader of Gaveb, A.U. Ryder, approached the First Consul of Albia, F.S. Seeker, about the idea of forming a temporary alliance to combat the growing conflict. In exchange, Gveb would see a relaxation of the limiting treaty placed upon them as a result of the First War of Iadidus. F.S. Seeker accepted, and the two unlikely allies stood side by side. As this was happening, Simply Just Lazy approached the warriors of the Considel about a potential war with Albia. Without a second thought, the Considel agreed to join their ally in their mission for revenge. On the morning of November 7th, 2021, the Tnu and Considal forces invaded and occupied the capital of Albia, Novodomus. Caught off guard, the surviving Albion forces retreated out of Novodomus and called upon their allies, Solaris and Gaveb. Albia and its allies thus performed a decisive counterattack outside Novodomus. Despite having more numbers, the Allies were no match against the skill of Tanu and the Considel. The Second War for Iadidus was a strategic victory for Tanu and the Considel, as they had managed to successfully cripple the Albion army, leaving them vulnerable to a direct war. Over a month passed with tensions increasing day by day. It seemed that only a great war would alleviate such tension, and so a great war was what was coming. The First World War is the largest series of battles in Iadidus' history. Beginning on the 11th of December, the First World War would incorporate three battles spanning over three days, finally ending on the 13th of December. Though, Valid justifications still remain debated and generally vary depending on who you ask. It is widely agreed upon that the aggressors of Tanu declared war on Albia due to Albia's hostility to non-democratic nations and their general inability to lead their own people. Whether true or not, the war was set in motion and sides were soon chosen. Tanu once again called upon their allies of the Considel who they fought with during the Second War of, of Iadidus. Albia also called upon their own allies for aid, which they would receive through the Sentinels and the newly formed Sardom of Bostadir. However, an unlikely ally would join them. The nation of Gaveb, who once fought against Albia during the First War for Iadidus, offered their help once again, which was accepted. With the sides established, the war soon began. What felt like a decisive Albion victory would all change during the defense of Novodomus. 
During the first skirmish, more Albions were dying than enemies being slain, and a lucky arrow shot over the Novodomus walls would end up killing the Kaiser of Gaveb, practically taking Gaveb out of the war early. But the key event that slowly ripped the chance of victory from Albia's hands was a revolt from their ally, the Sentinels. The Sentinels demanded further reparations, which Albia was forced to accept in fear of losing their ally mid-war. Because of the Sentinels' revolt, smaller towns within Albia began breaking off and declaring independence, due to now seeing the demise of Albia almost certain. The following battles would all bring Albia further and further into their now imminent grave. As the enemy forces of the Constadel and Tanu breached the walls, a final last stand was given by a hero of Albia known as AJ Moody. This would mark the end of the First World War. Albia would be forced to disband along with passing on all of the former nation's wealth onto Tanu. With Albia now ripped from the world stage, nations would begin building themselves up in hopes of taking their now vacant spot at the top. This, however, would mark the end of the Albion era. But a new era was just awakening. The era of birth was a real golden age in Iadidus history. Due to the fall of Albia and the expansion of the map, many significant nations were born during this time, and many existing nations would even see themselves rebranded, such as the Sentinels morphing into the fault of Ars. During the era of birth, the world stage would also begin to shift. Fault of Ars quickly began to claim its dominance, and just as Albia did months prior, they would begin to expand and grow at a rapidly fast rate, even establishing the Northeastern Pact, more simply known as the NEP, that, with the help of Voltovars, became one of the most dangerous alliances in Iadidus. Two more nations of great significance formed during the very beginning of the Era of Birth. The Sultans of Quamari and the Confederation of Terrorientis emerged as a result of the fall of Albia. The Sultan of Kumari, led by Roman, was once a town within Albia that declared independence on the 17th of December, five days after Albia fell. Terrorientis was mainly established by Albian refugees, looking for a new nation to be a part of. The nation was led by none other than F.S. Seeker himself, which made it a nation often dragged into heavy discussions, some going as far as calling it Albia, but simply with a different name. Terrorientis and Kumari would also begin to quickly rise and establish themselves in the changing world of Iadidus. Although usually shattered by the world dominance of Faltavars and the NEP, both Terrorientis and Kumari would soon enough claim their spots near the top of the dominance tree. Few conflicts did begin to emerge as the months passed by, but generally things remained civil. Such conflicts included the Ethnosian Civil War, which would see an unexpected triumph by the rebels, and a great conquest of the northwestern nations by the former leader of Solaris, Verdicant, which anticlimactically ended in them simply surrendering and paying hefty war reparations. Because of this general time of peace and a plethora of free land available to be claimed, new nations did not only prosper, but thrived. Such nations as Liberum, Pagonia, the above-mentioned Ethnos, Mir, Yavik, Gveb, which got reformed by yours truly, Sanctum, Mokria, Malachite, and even Faria would all come into existence during this time. However, like most things, tensions would soon begin to rise, and with tensions high, war seems only inevitable. On the 30th of April 2022, the Kwamari Sultanate sent out an announcement that shook the world. The Sultan, Roman, had been accused of wanting to annex and thus eliminate the island nation of Faria. Along with this, Cromari accused F.S. Seeker, the leader of the Confederation of Terrorientis and former leader of Albia, 
of wanting the direct execution of Kumari, and thus also turning former Kumari allies against them. Whether true or not, Kumari officially declared war on Freya with hopes of stabilizing the south. This, expectedly, sent a shockwave of terror through the world, as a devastating war seemed now ever certain. But things were only just starting. Valdivars, a nation that had practically taken over the world stage at this point, declared their support for Kumari's conquest against Freya, and denounced the Confederation of Terrorientes, who, at this point, had remained silent. A couple days later, F.S. Sika finally put out an announcement. In the announcement, Terrorientes and their allies stopped recognizing Roman as the leading authority in Kumari, as well as declaring their official aid to their ally, Faria, bringing them directly into the developing conflict. Almost all of Terrorientes' allies would join alongside them, with the freehold of Pagonia being the only notable nation to reject the call to arms and declare neutrality. Wanting to secure further allies, to turn the upcoming war in their undeniable favour, Kumari officialised an alliance with the Holy Kingdom of Sanctum, known well for their military might. In the midst of the developing war in the south, a devastating war was developing up in the northwest of Iadidus. Robert Fratzi, leader of the Faravate nation, which was the direct successor state to the former Sardom of Bostadir, declared war on the Crystal Empire, thus skip Shellstack and Malakor, asking for them all to be turned into protectorate states under Faravate in a mission to stabilize the Northwest. The nations of the Isidic Empire and Gweb, two successor states that also came from Bostadis Fall, declared their support and aid to achieving Faravate's mission in cleansing the Northwest. As things continued heating up in the north, more announcements came in the south. The well-known and historic nation of Avicen emerged to declare their protection of Faria. This was due to the kindness the former Albions who now inhabited the southern nations showed to Avicen during the Albion era. Things though still had not reached a conclusion, as Svaldivars summoned the nation of Strandland along with NEP volunteers into the war. With the sides now finally set in stone, the date was confirmed. Potentially the largest battle I added as had ever seen was going to take place on the 15th of May, 2022. However, things would not go as expected. The Comorians and their allies began their offense. Faria and their allies awaited in anticipation for their enemies to show, and they suddenly did. However, not by sea or land, but by sky. The Comorian forces secretly constructed a sky bridge that would allow them to drop down right on top of their enemies, avoiding the plethora of traps in the process. Despite catching the defenders off guard, a swift counter-offensive was executed to perfection, which resulted in the evacuation and retreat of the attacking forces. The top PvPers of the defenders began building up to the sky bridge and chased down the surviving soldiers. But just then, a, a large storm with uh, tornadoes appeared and started destroying everyone's defenses, which forced uh, both sides to halt their attacks. On the same day, Kormari announced the cancellation of the war. Because of this, unresolved accusations led to a heightening of world tension. Tension would only increase further after the Northwestern Conquest was also called off and left relatively unresolved. The abundance of tension would catapult the world out of one era and into a new one. One that would see Iadidus shift entirely. The Era of Death was a time of pure unknown. With world tension being at a boiling point, no wars or resolutions were sought out, only further destabilizing regions as a result. Things started out slow after the disappointing forced cancellation of the war, with some veteran players unfortunately losing interest and some even quitting the server altogether. 
Despite the formation of small alliances, obscure nations, and a union in the Aislandry continent, cleverly named the Kingdom of Aislandry, things were extremely quiet. Week after week passed, with weeks soon turning into months. The occasional new nation appeared, such as the nation of Ordu DJ and the Holy Empire of Shaldia, which was a unification of the nations of Malachite and Sanctum. But besides that, I had to stay silent. Veteran nations that still lurked around began deteriorating rapidly, with the nation of Avacyn at one point losing its nation claims and becoming a free target for robbers and thieves, losing many valuable artifacts in the process. This, in a way, would begin an unfortunate trend of chaos and uncertainty. On the 16th of June 2022, the short-lived kingdom of Aesilandry that sought to stabilize the continent collapsed into minor nations due to interior instability. On the same day, war threats from Mokria against the former Aesilandry nations were leaked. However, things were quickly resolved with the annexation of Mokria into the growing Gavebian Empire. Similarly to the Aesilandry Union, trouble with Gaveb and Mokria started, which concluded with Mokria's denunciation by Gaveb, along with a declaration of war if their demands were not met. The demands were first declined by Mokria and a war was scheduled. Gaveb, having already prepared for war, called their allies of Verocia, who also shared their disdain for Mokria. Mokria, knowing they stood no chance, finally surrendered to Gaveb, losing a large majority of their land in the process. After their surrender, Mokria would experience their first of many internal coups that would become a running joke on the server. Iadidus, though, generally remained quiet. Kumari, despite their lack of resolution during their war, continued developing, getting to a position where they were directly rivaling Faltavar's currently uncontested position at the top of world politics. But a new player would enter the political fight. The newly established Strea in Septum Empire, which was a unification of Prima Lux, Lordania, the town of Lionport, Enturia, Liberum, and Gaveb. Being that Gaveb was already the largest empire on the server at the time, the unification immediately turned the new Strea in Septum into the largest empire to ever exist. With Emmy Noob, one of the four founders of Albia, as the emperor, all seemed unstoppable for Strea. Though, Strea would experience the same common internal instability and thus lost the nations of Anturia and Liberum, who would both fall not long after their departure. Hoping to maintain the empire, Strea quickly reformed into the Adian Confederation, which bore a striking resemblance to the former nation of Albia. Leadership was first held by Lordania, however, their soon resignation was swiftly replaced by myself. There was a slight disruption to the eerie quietness of Iadidus. After Cormari briefly formed into the Cormari Rouge, did some Red Moon rituals, declared war on the Adian Confederation, killed their long-standing Sultan Roman, who was replaced by his murderer, which also happened to be his son, Vlobar, and then reverted back to plain old Cormari as if nothing had ever happened. On the 3rd of August, the original Kaiser of Gaveb, who miraculously survived the First World War despite getting killed by an arrow just as the war began, was entrusted to watch over the large Gavebian portion of the Adian Confederation. As I, Gaveb's current and best leader, was also the emperor of the entire Adian Confederation. However, on the same day, the old Kaiser of Gaveb rebelled against the Confederation, stealing Gavebian territory with him. Four days later, Gavab would collapse from internal issues. <laughs> However, it was unfortunately unsalvageable, which left a large vacuum within the now boneless Adian Confederation. This vacuum would never be filled, and the Confederation would have to be disbanded not long after. The Era of Death would conclude on the 24th of August 2022, with the sudden announcement that the nation of Faltovars, who had firmly held on to the world stage since the fall of Albia, had disbanded. Despite now opening up the world stage for the first time since the fall of Albia, Iadidus would only decline from this point. Instead of flourishing, with new nations being created in hopes of claiming supreme world power, 
more and more nations would follow the trend of death. The next and final era that nicely brings us up to present day Ayatidus is the Apocalypse Era. Players and nations all began to follow the same trend of disappearing. In this time, two nations came forward to take the world stage, that being the Freehold of Pagonia and the Confederation of Terra Orientis, who, despite everything, still continued to survive and in some cases even thrive. It seemed that despite the now barren apocalyptic world, both nations now reigned peacefully over Iadidus, as within both nations all seemed well. Even unimaginable events took place, such as a treaty of friendship between the Emperor of Tanu, Simply Just Lazy, and the leader of Terrorientus F. A Seeker, two former enemies during the Albion era now met together as friends. Komari's health had been declining over the previous months, but on the 30th of January 2023, Cromari lost its lands, and despite best efforts to keep it alive, all would fail, and the nation would fall. With Cromari now gone, the end times seemed imminent, as silence plagued the land. But just then, on the 8th of April, it was announced that Iadidus would reset onto a brand new world. New stories, new nations, new players, new, new, new. Everyone couldn't wait. And on the main server, I brought back a vamp. Bossadir returned and even the Potato oh, Empire. But that's it for Iadidus. Currently the new world is set to release sometime in early to mid June 2023, with the old world remaining open for those who wish to say their last and final goodbyes before the new world's release. But other than that, that has been Iadidus. I would first like to say a big Big thank you to the amazing staff team and of course the owner himself, Bloody Belgian, for making this first version of Iadidus so enjoyable. And of course, a big thank you to all the players for keeping things interesting over the entire lifespan of Iadidus version 1. Remember, Iadidus is a player-led server, meaning all the stories and events I mentioned today, which was really only brushing over the surface, was all done by players. But that's about it. If you're interested in being a part of the new Iadidus world, the Discord will be linked below, where you can keep up with what's happening and, more importantly, when. But other than that, this marks the end of my content on Iadidus version 1. But of course, there'll be more to come on Iadidus version 2. That being said, this... This has been Iadidus. Yeah.